Hello, everyone. This is my third expert interview. And today, I'm very fortunate to have Mr. Tom Morris with me. Well, every question you can ask has two answers, one normal answer and one philosophical answer. Philosophers are just a very different breed. They think different. They always find deeper reasons, deeper meanings and everything. So today, to find very different answers to the normal questions and to ask very different questions to the normal answers, I have a Yale uh, philosopher with me who is a PhD from Yale. He has written multiple books and very interesting books. My mentor, Mr. John Spence, is a very big admirer of, of him, and I am too. If you want to see his videos or read his books, you can go to his website or YouTube channel. I'll mention the link in the description. And if you want to see magic happening, then you can go to his LinkedIn page. He just posts a random pic and writes very deep stuff about that. I'm a very big fan of that. You, you should see it. So Mr. Tom Morris, how are you today? Very good, Rohan. It's great to be with you. So, sir, I'll start with my first question. We all know that communication is very important. Communication is the means of growth of humanity. It is the way we interact, we learn, we evolve. What are a philosopher's thought on communication and the importance of public speaking and all that stuff? You know, I think the philosophers have recognized for a very long time that one of the greatest sources of human power for good is in partnerships. In fact, if you read Aristotle's book, The Politics, um, and he believed that politics is about how best to live well together. That's the core of the political mission in life, how best to live well together. And when you read the book, The Politics, very carefully, you can easily come up with a formula, not, not Aristotle's own words, but these are my words to capture what I see in his book, that he believes that the highest power for human good comes in people in partnership for a shared purpose. So people, plural, in a certain relationship, partnership, uh, with a certain end or, or goal in mind, a shared purpose motivating those people, people in partnership for a shared purpose. As you can imagine, philosophers from the very beginning uh, globally have seen the importance of communication for bringing people together, for creating partnerships, and for articulating the shared purpose that alone will allow people to do great things together. So even in Aristotle's time, I believe he was summarizing and interacting with wisdom that had existed for a very long time. We can read the history of human literature uh, and, and, and find out, well, from the one of the most ancient epics, some people claim it's our most ancient epic, um, the epic of Gilgamesh, you see a bad king become a good king and what intervenes is a partnership. You look at other uh, 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 great literature, uh, the Iliad, for example, Homer's Iliad is, mm -hmm. is about the power of partnership. What happens when partnerships break down between Agamemnon and Achilles? And what happens when partnerships work in many of the battle scenes through the book? And speaking of battle scenes, uh, think about the Gita uh, with Arjuna and uh, the, the partnership it takes with uh, his charioteer. Uh, to, to uh, create a mindset and do great things together. Own in human literature, um, Dracula. I first read the, the famous novel Dracula a few years ago. I was shocked that it wasn't just a vampire story. It was a story about the power of partnership. A man who has cultivated his power for centuries in the story so that no one can stand up against him, no one can take him down but a bunch of ordinary people in partnership with each other, they do have the power together to defeat this great evil. Uh, the book, The Three Musketeers, uh, is about actually not just three, but four men who come together and are able to resist another great evil. All of uh, great literature is full of the power of partnership, and communication is at the core for creating great partnerships and, and helping people to work well together. So that's why I think philosophers have always appreciated 
the importance of communication. Uh, for the audience, Mr. Morris has mentioned some sources. He has mentioned Homer's epics, and he has also, also mentioned Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so the people who do not know, Homer was a Greek historian, I would say a poet, and Bhagavad Gita is an Hindu religious book. I recently finished reading it. <laughs> uh, so if you do not know about these sources, I would recommend that you actually read it, read them, you go through them, you will learn a lot. Yeah. So my second question, uh, if I remember correctly, recently you mentioned in one of your LinkedIn posts that you recently completed 1200 public speeches. Yes, yes, I'm right. yes, yes. That is a lot, seriously. <laughs> Like for a guy who is in his early 20s, 1200 speeches sounds a lot. So yeah. what difference do you see in your communication style from the time when you started, you gave your first business presentation or public speech was this mm -hmm. your 1200th speech? Yeah. Because I've seen your videos, YouTube videos, and you are using very good storytelling and you are dramatizing and you are acting and you are going all out and I just love it. So what yeah. difference do you see in yourself? Well, I was very lucky uh, or blessed, Rohan, early in the early days. I, I sort of understood intuitively most of the element uh, elements that go into a, a great public uh, speech. So I was doing storytelling. Uh, I was using good humor. I was trying to embody positive energy. I was using the power of movement and also the power of stillness. I, I, I was using a dynamic in my vocal presentation from very excited and very enthusiastic to very quiet and very measured and occasional silence now and then. I've seen people make every mistake you can imagine in public speaking uh, from pacing the floor frenetically and talking fast and never taking a break and never pausing uh, to people who just stand perfectly still and speak in a monotone voice and never show any passion or enthusiasm. I think being a professor and having big classes at the University of Notre Dame helped me understand what it takes to wake people up, to get them physically engaged and mentally alert for a presentation. You know, you, 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 you want to build a, a positive presentation around important ideas. Um, it can't be too many ideas, uh, just enough to give people tools they can use to improve their lives or their work. And you want to present those ideas, uh, which are the core of any great presentation, P present those ideas with good humor, good storytelling, good energy, um, and give them intellectual breaks along the way. That's the purpose of a funny story or a, a nice joke, or that's the purpose of my PowerPoint. I used to do just uh, words on the PowerPoint, just a few words. People make a lot of mistakes with PowerPoint. They use too many words on the screen and people can't really read. I would just have a, a few words to punctuate what I was saying. And a few years ago, an audiovisual specialist who was running the PowerPoint for a big presentation I was giving, he said, you should consider using vivid pictures and photographs in your PowerPoint. He said, your PowerPoint right now is very powerful because it's so simple. High contrast, no matter what the lighting is on the stage or in the room, it's never bleached out. People can see it. If you have 5,000 people in the room, they can see the PowerPoint so well. He said, but I think you could do even better because you're such a great storyteller. Put some images from those stories into your PowerPoint. And when I did, it made all the difference in the world. Because people are just using their cognitive faculties, listening to words, but they see a picture and it's a different part of the brain that responds to, and they may remember that picture like they'll remember a great story as a memory hook on which to hang the ideas. And, oh, I remember he told this great story. What was the story about? Oh, it was about the idea of courage. So you help people remember. And then I've always created little laminated wallet cards. On the back of the card, I'll have the cover of one of my books. And on the other side of the card, I'll have the ideas I'm talking about in that speech. This is from the talk, True Success, um, uh, you know, The Art of Achievement in Times of Change. So everybody in the room, whether there's 20 people or 10,000 people, everybody gets a card. So that six weeks later, six years later, 
I'll see them in a hotel or in an airport. They'll pull out their wallet. They'll pull out the card and say, I heard you one guy nine years ago, give this talk. And I read the card on a regular basis. It keeps me focused on what I need to attain success in life. An early Speakers Bureau agent, one of the most famous agents in America, mm -hmm. once said to me that I was a rare bird as a, philo as a philosophy professor who could become a, a popular public speaker. And I said, well, I thought being a professor prepared me to be a public speaker. He said, well, you would think that, but too many professors make a major mistake. They think that it's their job to pack as much information as possible into the time allowed. They don't understand that as a public speaker, your job is not first and foremost information. Your job is first and foremost impact. Information has to be subordinated to impact. The information that's needed for the impact you want to have, for the good you want to do, for the way you want to move people that day with your communication, to go out and change the way they live, to change the way they work. And he said, you intuitively understand the importance of impact over information. And that's why you're so successful. I just noted down that point that your job is not giving information. Your job is impact. Recently, I did an interview with Mr. Jess Ray. He is a very famous public speaker from Britain. And he said that every speech that I give is a performance. Yes. It's not just a speech. It's a performance. Yes. I have to deliver. I have to get their attention. And it must feel so nice when a person comes up to you and shows a card and says, nine years ago, you changed my life. Yeah. That feeling i am trying to visualize that feeling that you must get and i hope that in future in my pub career as a public speaker at least once i want to have a moment like this like you you can you can and another man came up to me in a hallway of a hotel and he said listen he was a he was a a, a senior executive at one of the biggest consulting firms in the world Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, listen to me. I have something important to tell you. I said, what is it? He pulls out his wallet and he holds it up in front of me. He says, my whole life, I've been proud that I only carry two things in my wallet, a credit card and a driver's license. Two things, only two things for years and years and years. Three years ago, I heard you speak on true success. And so now I want to show you what I have in my wallet. And he opens his wallet. There's a driver's license. There's a credit card. And there's my card on true success. He said, now I have three things in my wallet. Your, your friend who talked about performance is right. I read a book once about classroom teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I, I, when I was uh, a teacher at Notre Dame and I had won many teaching awards, the graduate students came to me and said, look, they teach us philosophy, but they don't teach us how to teach. Could you give us a session on how to teach? And I said, yes, I would be happy to. I hung up the phone and I ran to the library and checked out 20 books on how to teach, forgetting that I had been doing it for 10 years at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I read all these books. Most of them weren't very good. But there was one book uh, about the techniques. It was called Mastering the Techniques of Teaching. I think that was the title. The main idea in the book is this. The classroom is a dramatic arena. Everything that happens from the time you enter the room or the time your audience, your class, your students enters the room, everything that happens either helps you accomplish what you have in mind or detracts from what you have in mind. It either assists you or resists you. Make sure you use every element in the classroom to amplify your message. So, Rohan, even when I'm um, I'm going to give a speech in a big room. Say there's going to be 5,000 people in the room in a few hours or 10,000 people. Uh, I will go to the room early if I possibly can when it's empty. Mm -hmm. And I will look at the room. The first time it ever happened, it was a room of, it was a, a coliseum that a basketball, professional basketball team played in. I was going to have 5,000 people the next morning in that auditorium, in that coliseum. I walked in by myself at night in a dark arena. It scared me half to death. This place was so big. I was so nervous. My heartbeat went up. And I said, wait, for one hour tomorrow, this is my house. For one hour tomorrow, I own this place. Everything that happens in that hour is up to me. I get to do good 
for this many people for one entire hour tomorrow morning. Isn't that amazing? And my heart relaxed, my spirit relaxed, I had peace within, and I had a great, long, awesome standing ovation from 5,000 people the next morning in that room. I like to go to a room early and take the emotional ownership of that space. This is my space. What do I have to do for the man in the first row, the man in the last row, the woman in the middle? What do I have to do to reach everyone in this room and to get them with me to go on a journey, to go on an adventure? If it's 45 minutes, if it's an hour, I want it to feel like it's five minutes. I want them to leave saying, I wish that we could do this all day. And when, when you accomplish that, you've made a huge difference in the lives of the people that you've been honored to share that time with me. In fact, I had a lawyer once who said to me about one group, oh, Tom, Tom, this group you're about to speak to is a really important group. I said, please never say that to me. Every group I speak to is the most important group of people on the surface of the earth during the hour I'm with them. That's the mindset I bring to every audience. There's no audience more important than any other audience. Every audience is the most important audience in the world while I am in their presence. I have to believe that. I have to feel that. I have to show that. Another point that I, that I noted is every group is the most important. It's, this thought just got me. Like I am planning to write a book on public speaking and... Yeah. All these interviews are for that. Good. I'll make sure that I'll add this point to that book and give your name that this point was given to me by Mr. Tom Morris. This was Good. like really powerful. Thank you so much for sharing this. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to. And your original question, how have I changed over all these years? Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been doing this on some level for 40 years. I think I did all the right things from the beginning, but I've gotten better at those things. I believe that public speaking, like tennis, like golf, like skiing, is an art. It's a skilled behavior. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And even if you're doing all the right things to start with, you're doing them much better as you go on. I'm proud that I can still look at videos of old speeches and say, yeah, yeah, I was, do I was doing a, a good job then. But I think I, I do a much better job now because I've learned, Aristotle again said, you learn by doing. Uh, the, the, the finest form of learning comes in doing. And so because I've done it so much with every kind of group you can imagine, for a while I thought that Top leadership people responded the most strongly to my messages. And I speak on a variety of topics. In fact, when I'm asked to speak on something I don't know much about, rather than saying, well, I'm the wrong person for that, I'll, I'll almost always say, let me look into that. I, I, I can probably come up with something on that. Six months ago, I was asked to speak on hope, H-O-P-E. I, rather than saying, well, I don't know any more about hope than just the average person, I said, okay, I'll come up with something. And then a few months later, I was asked to speak on failure. And I didn't say, well, I've had failures in my life, but I've never thought about failure as a philosopher. I said, okay, let me look into it. So I gave those two talks, and people said in both, in both uh, occasions, well, this was the best talk of the whole conference. I benefited because I'm getting ready to write a new book. And I didn't realize it when I came up with the idea for the book that two important topics would be hope and failure in this new book. Because I said yes to people asking me to speak on something that I didn't feel like I was an expert on, I worked hard to become an expert over a matter of days or weeks or months, however long I had. And then they end up being perfect ideas for a book I had already planned, but I didn't realize that hope and failure were going to be important topics for this book until I said yes. I said yes to a man once. I, I had given a talk on true success for a global leadership group of about 275 people. The next year, they asked me to speak on If Aristotle Ran General Motors, another of my books. The year after that, they asked me to speak on uh, my latest book, which is called Plato's Lemonade Stand, Stirring Change into Something Great, H how you turn the, the lemons that life hands you and turn them into beautiful lemonade. He asked me to speak on that. Then he called me and said, we're reading a biography of Steve Jobs. 
Uh, he was a terrible person. He treated people horribly, but he built the world's biggest business, the most profitable business. How is that even possible? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, he said, could you come and speak to us on Steve Jobs? And rather than say, well, I know nothing about Steve Jobs, I said, okay, let me look into it. That became the book, Socrates in Silicon Valley, which is all about Steve Jobs. Because I was willing to say yes, I met friends of Steve Jobs, the first man he ever sold a computer to, a man that he drove around in, in a car with for six years, his direct report. People shared with me faxes that the famous biographers had not even seen, uh, Steve's personal fax communications. Because of saying yes to a topic people wanted, a topic people needed, even though it was not something I felt I, I was expert on, I tried to become expert on it so I could bring them something new. Standing ovation, it, it became a book. If you have a heart to serve people, you really want to be a servant, then you'll say yes to more things than you would otherwise say yes to. And the more topics you have to speak on, the more people can ask you back. A great bureau president once said to me, we have some very famous speakers who can never be asked back because they only have one speech. You have so many speeches, people can ask you back over and over and over again. I said, that's great. I love being a philosopher because whatever their concern is, I can try to figure out a new perspective for them. One thing that you mentioned indirectly in all that is your preparation level. You say that you met people, his friends, his colleagues, all that. This shows that how much you prepared for that speech. And this also highlights the point that every group is the most important group. You considered your audience very important. So you were willing to put so much hard work in preparing for that speech. And that was the result that your speech was the best speech of that conference and all yeah. that thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. to conclude this point for the audience, try your as hard as you can, prepare as hard as you can, because your audience is the most important group ever. Yeah. Every audience. Yeah. <laughs> and rather than that creating stress and pressure, that mm -hmm. create, can create excitement. We all have to learn to play the mind games mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, like I say, this is my space. I own this space. I'm here for them. The first time I spoke to 2,500 people, I was very nervous. And I suddenly said to myself, I'm not here for me. I'm here for them. I'm here for each person in each chair. There's a sense in which the number of people in a room, whether it's 20 or 200 or 2,000 or more, the number doesn't doesn't matter. It's each person in their ears, in their minds, in their hearts. I'm here for each person. I want to give each person here a gift they can use. That takes the pressure off me. I'm not thinking about myself. Oh, I want to be a great speaker. I want to get a big standing ovation. I want them to say, this was the greatest speaker we've ever had. No, 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 no. I'm here for them. I want to do something for them. I want to give each person a gift. Here's my gift to you. Here's my gift to you. That takes my attention off me. What is there to be nervous about? It's about them. That reminds me of an article I read around six months ago. And it said, nervousness and excitement are exactly the same things. Chemically, yeah. biologically, if you see the hormones that are released in both the processes, they are exactly the same. Yeah. The only difference is the thought that is creating that emotion. Negative thoughts creates nervousness. Positive thoughts creates Excitement. For example, like you were saying that you were speaking first time in front of 2,500 people. I also recall uh, something like that. I was first time speaking in front of 5,500 people or it was not a speech. It was more of like play, but mostly it was my speech. So I was the villain. I had to give a long speech. And I remember I thought, oh my God, 500 people. And <laughs> those people were very important people like masters. And one of them were, was a very famous Bollywood actor too. Though he was not present during my speech, he got up and went away. I don't know, maybe to washroom and all, but yeah, he was present. So it was very intimidating, intimidating psychologically. And I was like, 500 people. And then I thought, okay, wow, 500 people. I will be controlling them. They will be listening to me. So that mindset shift, that emotional shift changed my nervousness to excitement. And I performed with, with double energy. So yeah. I absolutely agree to whatever you said. 
Yeah, absolutely. You did the right thing intuitively, instinctively. It used to be, oh, Rohan, early in my career, I'd be sitting in the audience or I'd be backstage. They'd be introducing me and I could feel my heart rate get faster and faster. And early on, I would say to myself, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous. And I learned never to say that. I, here's what I say now. I'm getting ready. I am yeah. getting ready. <laughs> because the best people in every field have that sensation mm -hmm. to prepare them to be their best. The only people I've ever known who did not have this heart rate increase, they did terrible job because they didn't care. It's a measure of how much we care. And if we interpret it correctly, not I'm getting nervous, oh no, but oh great, I'm getting ready. It's a mm -hmm. wave we can surf on, right, to mm -hmm. our success as speakers. It's not not only public speakers do that because I have been a boxer uh, during my oh. education years. So we do this a lot. Like our coaches slapping us. You are a tiger. You are a tiger. You are a tiger. And like, I have a tiger. I have a tiger. So we do this in boxing, in sports, in every field. And we should include this in public speaking. That positive reinforcement. Like, yes, I am ready. I'm excited. So this is yeah. a very good point. So my yeah, next yeah. question would be, what business presenters can learn from ancient philosophy? Because most of the business presentations I see are terrible. I would say terrible. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. most of the big CEOs and all the big names in business, they do a very terrible job at giving business speeches. So yeah. What they can learn from ancient philosophy? Because uh, I was, again, I read a lot. So I was just scrolling through some of the books and I noticed that some of the, how powerful public speaking can be. Adolf Hitler was a very good public speaker. Mm -hmm. And with his public speaking skills, he convinced a whole country because he was not alone in doing all those crimes. There was a very large group of people who were supporting him because they were convinced that he's right, because they were convinced by him that what he's doing is right. So mm -hmm. public speaking is a superpower. It can be used for positive things. It can be used mm -hmm. for very negative things. Mm -hmm. So business people, they are very powerful people. They control the world, kind of. So what business presenters can learn from ancient philosophy? So you can answer this in a very general term as a philosopher yeah. or in terms of communication. I leave it up to you. Well, good. Uh, I would say two things. Once I was talking to a famous novelist, a mm -hmm. writer of fiction, mm -hmm. and um, I said to him one day, uh, this was 20 years before I wrote eight novels. I never thought I would write a novel. I never thought I would write fiction. And I mm -hmm. said to him, I wish I could do what you do. And he said, oh, you do. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we do the same thing. I said, but you're a novelist. You write fiction. You write great stories. I'm a philosopher. He said, yes, yes. We both are trying to understand the human condition. We're both doing the same thing. We just do it a little differently. And I said, oh, interesting. And I said, um, what makes a book a great book? And he said, I said, what makes a book a classic read through the centuries? And he said, oh, it's never just the beauty of the language. It's never just the cleverness in the structure. Mm -hmm. It's always about big ideas, big ideas. Um, I would say the philosophers would tell public speakers of our time, especially business speakers, it's never just about the beauty of the language. It's never just about the structure of the speech. It's the big ideas. It's the big ideas. But then I would bring in Aristotle right after that, because Aristotle, in his book, The Rhetoric, mm -hmm. wanted to understand persuasiveness. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do we convince other people <clears throat> to change their behavior? to vote for me as a candidate, to uh, agree to our new strategic plan and work for it in our company, uh, to win over a new piece of business. How do we convince anyone anytime about anything? He divided it into three things, masterful salesmanship, masterful persuasiveness. And every public speaker is trying to sell ideas mm -hmm. or a perspective or a behavior. Every public speaker is trying to be persuasive. So I think we benefit to go back to Aristotle's three things. He says it comes down to three things. I'll give you the Greek words and then translate them. Logos, pathos, ethos. Logos, logic, information, rationality, big ideas. But 
to support those big ideas, pathos, passion, enthusiasm, emotion. Understand the emotions of the people in your audience. Understand your own emotions. Bring them positive emotions. Spark their emotion. It's not enough for them to understand with the head. They have to feel in the heart. Logos and pathos. And then finally, ethos. Come across as credible and trustworthy. That was the Greek word for character. And in ancient Greece, they understood character in terms of um, honesty and courage and so many other qualities that are in the, the, the English word virtue comes from the Latin virtu, which meant power or prowess or strength, just like the term superpower, right? It would be a super virtue, mm -hmm. right? Understand that if you can come across as a person of good character, a person trustworthy, a person of virtue, and wisdom is one of the virtues, people want to listen to you. If you're pathos, you have passion, you can move them, but you have to have the, the logos, the big ideas to move them in a particular direction. And uh, Aristotle, it said that some man asked him, how can I come across as having good character? And he said, uh, you can come across as having good character if you have good character. <laughs> so work <laughs> on your character, build it, not just the image of it, but the reality itself. Now, there are people in public spaces, there are politicians, there are government leaders who fool people a lot, who pretend to be of good character, who pretend to believe in the right things, but are doing it manipulatively. They can succeed for a while, but they're always eventually found out. It always eventually collapses. The great philosophers East and West across cultures have understood that character is at the foundation of sustainable excellence and success. So logos, pathos, ethos, logic, passion, character. That's your combination from ancient philosophy that will make every speaker of our time better. Good stuff, isn't it? The stuff is so good that I had to take a pause to process all that information. <laughs> Though this idea is not new to me because I read a lot. And I, in fact, I read a lot of philosophy. As good. I told you, I recently finished Bhagavad Gita. So uh, yeah. character building is one of the main uh, ideas of that book. Yeah. So still, I took a break. I took a pause to process all that information because it, if you see it superficially, it's not much. But if you try right. to feel it, if you try to understand it, it can take like months to understand, to focus on just one thought. That's right. Sir, what, though you have already covered it uh, in brief, but still I would like you to elaborate it. What is the advice for teachers when communicating with students? Because in not just in college, in elementary schools, in primary schools, in high schools, teachers have a very big responsibility. Their mm -hmm. communication styles can make or break a child's future. I personally have dealt with teachers who had terrible communication. Yes. So, and that has impacted my life a lot. This is my like personal story. I had wonderful teachers, teachers, and I had really bad teachers. So what is your advice for teachers as a philosopher, as a teacher, as a public speaker? What would yeah, you say? That, that's a very good question. The Harvard philosopher and psychologist, William James, who lived about 100, 150 years ago, he published two volumes, Principles of Human Psychology, two big books all over on my shelf over there, you know, a thousand pages or more. And he said, after they were published, he said, ah, one thing I omitted to say in my principles is that the single greatest human need is the need to feel appreciated. The need to feel appreciated. If teachers, like public speakers of any kind, realize that their need to provide information is always subordinate or secondary to their need to have a positive impact, and if they will understand their impact in terms of showing appreciation for their students in such a way as to be encouraging, in such a way as to build the confidence of their students, because what they're ideally trying to create is a group of lifetime learners 
who outside the classroom will educate themselves because they've been encouraged to do so, because they've grown in their own confidence as learners, because they know they are valuable, vital citizens of the world, as Diogenes once said, I am a citizen of the world. Well, if teachers can have this attitude, play with ideas, have fun, uh, make jokes, know your students as people if you possibly can, if the size of the class allows that, but always be encouraging. I've known philosophers. You would thought they, you would have thought they were hunters. Uh, somebody throws out an idea, they try to shoot it down uh, right away. Boom, boom, boom. They're shooting down other people's ideas and everybody stops giving ideas at a certain point. Other, other philosophers are encouragers. That's what I try to do. So I would say to teachers, you are creating future learners. You are creating future citizens of the world who have a chance to do good long after you're retired, long after you're gone from this, from this stage. You have a chance to live on in the lives and learnings of these people who you've encouraged and that you've appreciated as distinctive human beings. That's the number one job of a teacher. What I can recall is that uh, during when I was 14, 15, I started believing that I'm very bad at mathematics. <laughs> and yeah, because I had very bad guidance. So when I was in last year of my school, I found a maths teacher. Uh, he teaches near my house. He has a mathematics center called School of Mathematics. And he made me believe that I can do mathematics. And now I am a mechanical engineer. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I do triple cal integration, all those crazy mathematics stuff. I do that easily. In fact, I do it best in my batch. Yeah. So one good teacher, yeah. one appreciation can ch literally change the life. So, sir, this yeah. is the end of all those formal questions regarding communication. Now I would like to ask you two informal type of questions. What are some books that have inspired you? Uh, if you can you can tell one book about communication that is related to communication, if you can, and one book in general that has inspired you a lot and you would like my audience to read them. That's good. Um, that book about teaching that I mentioned earlier, Mastering the Techniques of Teaching, I think the author's name was Joseph Lohman, L-O-W-M-A-N. He was a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, 50 years ago, a long time ago, the book was written, but it was the best book I ever read on teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely by far uh, the best. You know, I haven't come across generally books on public speaking, so that's why it's so good that you're, you're working on this project. It's a very important uh, uh, thing to do. And I've mentioned Aristotle a number of times. And mm -hmm. Aristotle can be a challenge to read because his books were not written as books. They were his lecture notes for his advanced students. And so sometimes you have to kind of figure out, okay, what does he mean here? But the philosophers I found easiest to read that have amazingly good advice mm -hmm. are, are some of the Roman Stoic philosophers, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus. Marcus was emperor of Rome, Seneca was a prominent lawyer, Epictetus was a slave who was freed. So the three levels of ancient Roman society, they speak with one voice from their very different positions about the inner game we need to bring to outer challenges. Marcus Aurelius's Meditations uh, is a really good book to read. Seneca, the letters and the essays, he, he mentored a younger lawyer, uh, Lucilius, and his letters to Lucilius are oh, full of advice about how to think about success and how to deal with anger and disappointment and grief and the very all the things we encounter. So I would say Meditations of Marcus Aurelius or the letters of Seneca, letters and essays, uh, those would be great things um, to, to, to read for people who might not otherwise come across them. Now, there are many other great books of practical philosophy. I would love people to come to my website, Tom V is in Victor, Tom V and look up, look at my books. And perhaps my first short novel, The Oasis Within, will give people many of the inner tools of, of calm and peace and power that they need to make a difference in whatever they're doing, especially if it includes public speaking. Uh, and that leads to seven more novels. It's an epic tale set in Egypt in 1934 and 1935. A wise man named Ali who gave me all the advice I've ever wanted 
uh, to receive about life's wisdom. He was a fictional character, but he's been my greatest uh, uh, teacher probably in my life, uh, coming up with things as I watch the movie in my head, coming up with things I never thought of before. So I would recommend that to your audience. And, and I would welcome people to contact me through my website if they have a question, if they have a comment. Uh, as you know, I love to interact with people on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, wherever people want to find me. I try to philosophize almost every day some little idea that could make a difference for people. And I would welcome anyone to come as my philosophy partner, just like I, I, I love the fact that you are my philosophy partner on LinkedIn, uh, Rohan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll mention the links of your website, your LinkedIn, or your books, everything on in my description. And Good. The, the titles of your book are like very interesting. What if Aristotle managed general... <laughs> Harry Potter led General Electric. Like yeah. Very, very interesting. And I generally never read fiction. Like yeah. It's my thing. I always read nonfiction. Uh, yeah. There is only one series, a fictional series that I have read, Lord of the Rings, when I was a teenager. Otherwise, I never read fiction, but maybe I'll take up your books. <laughs> I was just like you, Ryan. I never read fiction either. Never did. Until my late 50s. And I've discovered so much wisdom in fiction. If you read the right books, the classics, I think my books, The Oasis Within and the books that follow that are the greatest philosophy I've ever been able to do in my life, applicable to everything in our lives. So I think if you enjoyed reading anything of mine, dip your toe into the water with The Oasis Within and let me know what you think. I would. I would. That's a problem. I would be honored. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and by the way, the seven C's of success. I do not have your card because we have never personally met. But uh, there is a small diary that I keep as my to-do list. Your seven C's are written on the first page, by the way. <laughs> that's Mr. great. Mr. John Spence recommended that book to me. And yeah. uh, that's written on my first page. So if That's very we, nice. I have it taped to my computer monitor right in front of me. I have an old version of the card that's uh, that's white with uh, uh, the uh, big black letters. It doesn't have any pretty picture on the back, but I have it taped to my computer. So I remind myself, okay, am I remembering all these things? Am I, am I slacking off on one of them? Do I need to refocus my attention on one of these seven conditions, which really helps us all to attain success in uncertain times, in challenging times? Because the philosophers came up with these ideas across the centuries, across cultures, in good times and in bad times, they're ideas that will always help us in whatever we do. Absolutely. Uh, if we ever meet, if you ever come to India or I come to your place, please give me that card. <laughs> Yeah, I will. I will do that. I, I will do that. One of my one of my friends is an international businessman who lives about a mile away from me, and he's from India. And uh, uh, he, he, wonderful. Uh, uh, his name is Vinod, and uh, he he encourages me all the time, and 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 uh, we we talk philosophy all the time. So I appreciate the great people of India and the value you have always placed on wisdom throughout the centuries. Uh, it's it's a, you're, you're a global example of people who care about diving deep and understanding life in powerful ways. And so it's just an honor to be with you in this podcast. Sir, is there any person like John, Mr. John Spence recommended me your name? Is there any person that you think will be important for this project? A person that I should talk next? Maybe your friend, your mentor, your mentee, anyone? That yeah, can provide are... me with a that can provide me with a different angle of public speaking that nobody talks about. For example, nobody talks about philosophy in public speaking, but yeah. we just talked so much about it. So, someone who can provide 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 me with a very different angle of public speaking. Yeah, I will come up with something for you. I will. I have a couple of people in mind already, uh, who have different uh, kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, his name is David Rindle, R-E-N-D-A-L-L, -L, David Rindle. He, he did a book called The Freak Factor, F-R-E-A-K. His idea is that the things you were criticized for as a child may be the key to your future success. He likes mm -hmm. to say, when I was a kid, everybody told me to sit down and shut up, sit down and shut up. And he said, now I make my living standing up and speaking. <laughs> so he has this approach. 
Yeah, absolutely. He has this way, and he dresses in pink, in bright pink uh, jackets or suits. He very flamboyant. He gets the attention of his audience. He travels the world. Uh, I, I've known him before he became a, a famous uh, public speaker. He would give you different perspectives uh, that would be really worth listening to. And we'll think of more names in the future. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Tom. This is the end of the interview. Thank you, audience, for listening to it. I hope I got so much information from it, so much new ideas from it. I hope you also got new ideas from Mr. Tom Morris. If you want, you can reach him on his LinkedIn, on his website. I recommend reading his books because he's just awesome. Thank you for watching.